Submarines are instruments of war. They rely on stealth and surprise. They need to be underwater for these qualities to shine. To make a submarine go underwater and to control its depth is a little bit more complicated than the popular assumption. To submerge, manoeuvre underwater and surface, a submarine needs control. Early submarine designers grappled with the problem of how to control their submarines. To submerge was easy enough, but to return to the surface, another matter. Whatever the shape or size of the submarine, the big problem was getting the weight right, because this determined the buoyancy. Even today, this is an issue. The weight of the submarine is absolutely critical. We weigh all the equipment that goes on board. We even weigh things like pipe clips. We know how heavy electrical cable is by the metre. So we know how much weight we're putting on the submarine. And there is a, a whole department which concentrates solely on weight control because that will define its buoyancy, its stability, and all these other naval architecture parameters. By the late 19th century, submarine designers had learned that by attaching ballast tanks to the hull and letting water into them, they could make the submarine submerge. For the diver, his ballast tank is the jug. But to return to the surface, the water had to be pumped out. This was very difficult manually operated ballast tanks. The breakthrough came in 1888, when a French submarine used compressed air for the first time to force the water out. This meant that at last, a submarine could determine precisely when and how quickly it returned to the surface. Buoyancy control had been cracked with compressed air, but there was still the problem of how to manoeuvre the submarine effectively underwater. Within five years, the French had again provided the answer. Give a submarine wings. A lot of people don't realise that a submarine essentially flies on its hydroplanes like an aeroplane. The only way it can move in the water, up or down, or through the water, is by being propelled and by the diving surfaces, the hydroplanes, forward and aft, which tilt, tilt to drive you down, tilt up to drive you up. The French Navy added small horizontal wings to the front of an experimental submarine. They behaved in a similar way to a fish's fins. The submarine's manoeuvrability was dramatically improved by the addition of these hydroplanes. And all this ten years before the Wright brothers took off. From now on, submarines could fly. So underwater control has been revolutionised. Though very vulnerable if hit, once dived the submarine is extremely difficult to find. Yet one of the tools it uses to hide once threatened its very existence. At the end of World War I, submarines ruled the ocean. But then a new invention changed the whole game. Sonar. Sonar was the underwater equivalent of a radar system. And it performs in very much the same, except Radar uses radio waves, and sonar uses sound waves. And sound waves travel four times faster and further in water than in air. With the invention of sonar, submarines could be detected by surface ships. But submarine fleets acted swiftly. By 1939, they had their own sonar equipment, and they too used it to find their targets. Active sonar is when we actually transmit, and we transmit a pulse of energy that will go out through the water as a ping. We've probably all heard it on films. It will hit, be it another submarine, and bounce back, which will give us a range. As the Battle of the Atlantic raged, the pressure was on submarine designers to invent a device that would defeat sonar. It was German engineers who made the breakthrough with an ingenious cloaking device, rubber tiles. But these new cloaked U-boats became operational too late to affect the outcome of World War II. Basically, the tiles are a rubber overcoat. And if you're transmitted at by an active sonar, the tiles will, first of all, diffuse um, and soak up the uh, energy of the transmission made at you. 
But even the latest rubber tiles can't make a submarine completely undetectable. By the 1950s, the whole emphasis had switched to making submarines as silent as possible. But that's no easy business. We are in, for want of a better word, a tin can. Now, anything that rattles or shakes in that tin can is totally magnified, amplified, and will emit a sound out through the pressure hull so that the other enemy submarines can pick us up. You build quietness into a submarine with extreme difficulty because the loudest noise that you cure... Great, I've cured the loudest noise. I now have a new loudest noise. So it is always a battle to cure the next loudest noise. This is HMS Onyx, one of the Royal Navy's Oberon class of submarines. Decommissioned now, but when built in 1967, there was nothing else like it. It was a very quiet uh, diesel electric submarine, and in electric mode, uh, was very, very difficult to detect. Oberon submarines closely monitored their own noise. They put shock absorbers on machinery to stop vibrations going through the hull and out into the sea. Today, this technique has been taken to a whole new level. This motor is sitting on a metal plate. Sensors have been connected to measure the sound waves transmitting through the metal plate into the water. The noise generated is displayed on these screens. But when a piece of foam rubber is inserted between the motor and metal plate, a dramatic reduction can be seen. In submarine construction, this is known as rafting. Keith Gaines served as a sonar operator on Royal Navy submarines. He followed a strict Cold War regime of silence as they sneaked up on Soviet ships. We would shut down all unnecessary machinery, eye fans, um, anything that's going to make a noise. Keith used listening devices called hydrophones to eavesdrop on the Russians. Picking up sound in the water like this is called passive sonar. A passive sonar is where you, you just want to listen to the information that's in the, in the water around you. We have a, a ball hydrophone here, which is um, commonly used in sonar systems. If this was dipped into the sea, we would very much like a microphone, which you could listen to all the underwater sounds. Keith and his fellow sonar operators could almost hear a pin drop. Say was someone in the engine room, for instance, and was doing a repair and he had a spanner and he dropped that spanner onto the deck plates, so you would get a crash, which would be like banging a drum, basically. And you would hear that for 50, 60 miles away. Contact bearing uh, 220, classified warship. With passive sonar, Keith's submarine could get a contact and sneak up on an unsuspecting enemy. We'd have a listen to what was going on, what was being said over the intercoms and communications. And we might pop up the periscope, take a few sneaky snapshots to try and gather more intelligence. This was a very dangerous game. On one occasion, noise from a chip propeller nearly gave Keith's submarine away. The whole back end of the submarine was shaking like a dog shaking its tail and resonating a, a very loud noise. Keith and his crew were lucky. On another day, this could have proved fatal. Much depended on the sonar operators. They relied on their own skill to distinguish the manifold noises of the sea. Fascinating, the sea noises. You have the, 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 the snapper fishing. Like that sort of noise. You have the wailing noise of the whale, which is like cries in the ocean. And, and when you're under the ice, and say at the North Pole, as submarines go up there, you hear the ice crunching and creaking and moaning. It's, it's, it's very eerie, but very fascinating noise. It's very difficult to discriminate sometimes between uh, what might sound like a submarine target and is actually a, a seal or a a grope of fish or uh, a well. In the late 1990s, sophisticated computer sonar analysis was introduced on all Royal Navy submarines. It classifies different underwater noises. It helps the sonar operator make sense of the sounds he hears, each with its own acoustic signature. 
you could get, say, a fishing vessel, and it's very fast revving, it's got a high-speed diesel engine in. Of a merchant ship. <laughs> On a warship, it might be. So the modern submarine is a highly evolved weapon of detection. It uses ultra-sensitive ears for both defense and attack. Submarines in the 21st century are very fast, virtually silent, can go anywhere they like, and need never surface throughout an entire patrol. But these are still not yet perfect machines. The loss of four Russian submarines since 1970 highlight the dangers of nuclear power. Even the nuclear reactor may eventually become obsolete. One day, somebody will have a breakthrough on battery technology. That, combined with uh, fuel cell technology, may very well write the end of nuclear-powered submarines. In the never-ending search to build the ultimate submarine, others foresee a different future. Not so much changes in technology, but a rethinking of the whole role of submarines. The submarine of the future will be a mother ship fitted with lots of remotely operated babies. And these babies will have a variety of roles. They'll be mine hunters, they'll be intelligence gatherers, they'll be communication surveyors. So you're going to end up with a highly flexible, multi-role, invulnerable sea control machine. And uh, it's a very exciting prospect.